hello uh a warm welcome to all of you uh i hope you all had a good lunch so some problem with my video but that should not uh uh create a problem i guess so uh this uh tutorial is basically an invited tutorial on explainability in deep learning so uh i guess uh, many of you might be knowing professor vinith balasubramanian who's with uh, iit hyderabad and anybody who knows him will know that uh, his uh, group does excellent research uh, in this area uh, most notably the the gradcam plus uh, plus algorithm came from his group so without uh, much uh, ado let me just uh, uh, give the stage to vinith vinith please thank you uh thank you very much ram am i audible and uh, visible and hopefully my slides are being seen yes all all good all good okay great wonderful thank you uh thank you once again for uh, firstly inviting uh, me for this tutorial and uh, providing this opportunity to share uh, the knowledge that we have gained in this space and probably a little bit of our work in this space also and uh, thank you for the kind uh, introduction uh, also to ram Uh, good afternoon to everybody so uh, i am a faculty in the department of computer science and engineering and also currently coordinate the ai department at uh, iit hyderabad uh, and today's tutorial as ram just mentioned is on explainability in deep learning so this is going to be an introductory tutorial i think uh, today this space has become uh, quite vast to cover in a short duration probably even 3 hours wouldn't suffice and one and a half hours even uh, lesser but i'll do my best to give an overview of the entire space at this point the motivations uh, a peek into the methods that are used in the space and probably also talk a little bit about open challenges uh, towards the end uh, so just one minor comment on logistics please do feel free to ask questions at any point in time uh, i would have been very happy if this session was in person and physical it would have been nice to interact and uh, share notes unfortunately given the virtual nature uh, please do feel free to interject and ask questions at any point i'd love for this to be interactive as much as possible okay so uh, perhaps the first thing to start off with is uh, why explainability at all i think uh, to some extent everybody is aware of the context of the problem today but nevertheless to contextualize uh, all of this discussion today uh, i think one of the primary precursors and drivers for work in explainability has been uh, the lot of legal regulations that have been going around the world at this point in time notably there was european union's gdpr the general data protection regulation which was i think uh, enacted about 2 3 years ago um, and what this particular uh, clause in the gdpr says is that a business using personal data for automated processing must be able to explain how the system makes decisions okay this is in a particular article and recital of uh, gdpr this is part of the european union similarly the us actually has multiple such legal clauses one such clause is known as the algorithmic accountability act which was passed in 2019 which requires companies to provide an assessment of risks posed by an automated decision system to privacy or security and the risks that contribute to inaccurate unfair biased and discriminatory decisions i think there have been a lot of news articles ar around this over the last uh, especially year or so and there have been different such laws in fact even uh, some laws at the level of states in the us uh, so one question somebody could ask at this point in time is uh, i think maybe if i if you all right can i request uh, everyone to mute i'm hearing some sound uh, it might just be easier uh, please do feel free to unmute and ask questions at any point in time okay all right okay thank you so uh, so one question that somebody could ask at this point in time is this seems to be almost like a first world problem there is european union's regulation here there is us algorithmic Ac accountability act and several other uh, legal regulations here so is this really a first world problem why should uh researchers in india worry about it or why should researchers in uh, nations such as ours worry about it uh, a very simple example we live in a very global connected world today assuming let's say you work for a company like tcs or infosys uh, 
And let's say there is a particular group or team in uh, one of these software services companies that's developing software for a bank, let's say in Germany. Okay, so now we all are aware that banks today use machine learning to decide whether to give a loan to a customer uh, at a given point in time or not. Okay? So if that software used by the bank now denies a certain customer a loan in Germany, now according to the European Union's GDPR, that customer has the right to go back to the bank and ask the question, why was this decision made on my particular case, right? And now the bank, according to GDPR, is liable to give an explanation of why that decision was made for that particular customer. Now, obviously, since the software was developed by, say, a company in India, that question is going to get passed back to India. And the Indian company has to now, and the team in India perhaps now has to come up with the explanation of how that decision was arrived at for that particular customer uh, in, say, Germany. So, uh, so inherently, this now is just not a first world problem. It's a problem for all researchers around the world, all practitioners around the world that use machine learning uh, and AI and deep learning in various product lines. It's important now that these uh, algorithms and models not just give predictions, but also give explanations. More fund fundamentally, there's always been uh, one of the fundamental rights called the right right to explanation. So you can go and look at this link on Wikipedia to understand this better. Historically, it was never construed in the context of AI or machine learning. It was generally a right to explanation whenever a decision is made, be it a credit score or be it uh, someone, say, being arrested somewhere. There was always a right to explanation. But now this right to explanation is being invoked in the context of AI and machine learning models that are being deployed in practice. In India, too, there has been a lot of uh, strategizing around implementing AI in a broader sense for various uh, streams of uh, industries, governance, so on and so forth in the country, too. And Niti Aayog has come up with a responsible AI strategy. Uh, almost, it's almost, they've been working on it for at least two, two years plus. And this document is currently in the public domain. It is a two-part document, one which talks about what responsible AI may mean in India. And the second document talks about how do you enforce responsible AI in the context of, of India. And what does responsible AI uh, mean in the context of explainable AI? Explainable AI is a very, very important cornerstone of responsible AI. Because if you want to deploy AI in a responsible manner, you one of the cornerstones is going to be transparency in decision making and explainable uh, models that are deployed in practice. So that's the broader context of why explainability has become important in the last few years. So obviously that has evoked an equal reaction from the technical community that works in the broader space. And uh, today the efforts in the broader space of explainability are uh, not just explainability, responsible uh, AI machine learning, I would say, are broadly categorized into four dimensions. Uh, one way of acronym by acronymifying the uh, efforts has been FATE, which stands for fairness, accountability, transparency, and ethics, all of which are important to ensure that the models that are deployed are fair to all populations that they affect, accountable for the decisions they make, transparent in terms of how the decisions are made, and finally, ethical in terms of use and practice. So there have been multiple technical conferences and fora for exclusive discussions on this topic, ACM, uh, also has a conference called FACT, Fairness, Accountability and Transparency. It's in fact now been running for about five to six years at least. Then the AAAI and ACM communities have also come together and initiated a conference, AIES, AI Ethics and Society. And there's also a broader conference compass which talks about computing and sustainable societies, where also dialogues around this, uh, implementing AI in a transparent manner has become very important. So and all of these communities have been uh, vibrant communities where uh, people working in AI and machine learning, as well as social scientists who probably uh, model user behavior and try to account for these things, come together and discuss issues uh, at the interface of AI and society and come together with solutions. So hopefully some of these uh, have all already translated to practice or will translate to practice in the years to come. So with that brief context, so uh, the outline for the rest of the session today, for this tutorial today, is going to be to continue to give you a motivation and overview of the efforts in explainable uh, deep learning, very broadly speaking, over the last few years. Then we'll step 
a little bit technical into talking about uh, one aspect of explainability in deep learning, which are attribution methods, probably the most popular of the efforts in uh, explainability. Then I'll very brief, briefly talk about some of our ongoing efforts in the space and uh, conclude with some open problems and challenges, which are a plenty in the space uh, towards the end of uh, the session. So this is going to be a semi-technical talk. So we will get into some details of the methods, but probably not get too technical or too mathematical to probably keep it uh, relevant to a wider audience. It will be an intermediate level talk. But uh, I am going to assume a basic background uh, of uh, knowledge in machine learning and deep learning for the rest of this uh, for the rest of this talk. But if any of the things, uh, are... sorry yes. to interrupt you. So uh, as I said, I'll, I'll probably uh, interrupt you at regular intervals to kind of take up Absolutely. questions. Sure, There's sure. already one question that's come from Guta Jayakrishna, who's who's asking whether rule mining from data and explain explainable AI are the same or or they different. Sure. So probably I'll answer this in the next uh, in this next few slides, which I'm going to talk about the motivation and the overview. If I don't answer it, maybe I'll come back to this question uh, a bit later. Hope that's all right. Shall we uh, move on for the moment? OK, yeah, I'll move on. Probably this question will get uh, answered as we go forward uh, over the next few slides. So one disclaimer before going through the rest of this uh, tutorial is that uh, explainability has evolved over the last few years. In fact, one of the earliest uh, motivators for work in the space of explainable AI more broadly was uh, an effort by DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency in the US. So they started a lot uh, funding initiative somewhere in 2015, which led to a lot of the efforts over the last few years. But over the five, six years since that, uh, in that, since that initial uh, prod, there have been so many different efforts from different directions. So it's a very broad space at this point in time. So obviously, I'm not going to get a chance to cover all of them. Uh, it is a multidisciplinary field today. So there are aspects of machine learning, computer vision, NLP, speech, HCI, social science, so on and so forth. So this, the rest of this tutorial, I'm not going to say is an exhaustive survey, but uh, I'm going to keep it as an overview of key technical methods that uh, broadly people use in deep learning at least. And uh, as much as we speak about bias of deep learning, I think as humans, we cannot live without a bias. So since I broadly work in the area of computer vision, so most of my examples may revolve around uh, a vision bias, so to say. But uh, I think the technical details that we will refer to are probably broadly relevant to any other data type that any one may use in practice also. OK, so um, having said that, I'll come back to this question on rule mining in a couple of slides when I have a slide to talk about it, I think. But let's just perhaps take a step back and try to understand where the success of machine learning in general has been over the last, say, decade, decade plus. Right? So if we all of us use machine learning in various applications, be it your Amazon Alexa, be it your uh, Apple Siri, be it your spam, uh, uh, your spam filter in your email, your Facebook face detector, your Google Translate. I think machine learning is everywhere around us today. And if you had to abstract out what kind of questions to these deployed models answer, the kind of questions would be, what is the product relevant to the user? What is the sentiment of this tweet? What are the objects in this image? What is the word being spoken now? So on and so forth. The abstraction here is what is X, right? So that's the fundamental question where machine learning has been successful over the past decade or couple of decades. And if you observe all these successful case, case studies of machine learning over the last decade, decade plus, most of these applications, the cost of a bad decision is actually low, right? If you have a bad, let's say, movie recommendation or a product recommendation, you perhaps lose 500 rupees, 1000 rupees. Maybe you lose three hours if it's a movie but you don't lose a life, you don't lose an arm or a leg. And accuracy is often considered all important. Right? So as long as you get, uh, somebody gets 90% accuracy, somebody else gets 92% accuracy, you consider that to be a good improvement and papers are written around it, probably patents are made around it and they probably even translate to product lines at this point in time. This seems like a very one dimensional way of viewing performance in general. Right? So then what is it that we really want? Where is it that uh, we still feel this is not good enough is more complex real world systems. If you consider, say, risk sensitive systems, 
or safety critical systems, be it medical diagnosis, financial modeling or prediction, or say something like cockpit decision support. By looking at it, you know that this is something where one could lose a life, probably multiple lives, an arm or a leg, or a significant loss of property. And in these kinds of risk sensitive systems, machine learning is yet to be used in a full fledged way, right? So we've all gone through uh, the COVID uh, pandemic at this point in time, probably multiple waves, probably going through one at this point in time. It's a little surprising to see, if you just sit back and think, it's a little surprising to see that for all the hype around AI, for all the hype around machine learning over the last few years, right, uh, seems to be the technology that's spoken about most often by everybody, not just people in this space, by people across all industry sectors. I'm not sure if any, we have, any of us have seen, uh, say, a hospital where you walk in or where they have deployed a machine learning model where you upload your blood sample or upload your blood diagnostics and it tells you your risk over the next one month. Right. Considering the success of machine learning, this is something that we should perhaps have expected. Right. Why is it that we don't see it? Right. It's a very simple question to ask, especially considering that we've gone, we're going through this COVID pandemic at this point in time. And a simple answer to this is, these kinds of applications, such as in healthcare, which is obviously risk sensitive, the cost of a bad decision can be really, really high. It's not about deploying a machine learning model. It's about, let's say, assume that that machine learning model that was that was it was trained on data that was captured by, say, a large population. It has a 97% accuracy. The problem is the cost of a bad decision can be extremely high. What if there was a person who was in that 3% of, of the total number of cases where the model gets it wrong. It could lead to a loss of life or perhaps uh, something as serious in, 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 in reality. So clearly here, accuracy is not the only objective. Right? So we are, we are looking for something multidimensional, not just something that gives us an accuracy number. We probably want something more than accuracy. Right? Imagine that, uh, God forbid, but imagine that Anyone, uh, let, let me let me not say me or you, but let's just say anyone walks into a hospital and there's a robotic uh, assistant there that uses a machine learning model that looks at a, a patient who's walked in, uh, looks at their blood diagnostics and says, okay, your, uh, your COVID risk is minimal, just go back home. Right? And somebody tells us that that robotic assistant's accuracy is 98% or even 99% for that matter. Right? So the question is, would somebody walk back home at that point in time? Or would somebody say, I need to talk to a doctor to find out why this model is saying so? Right? That rationale becomes extremely important to make decisions in these kinds of risk sensitive scenarios. It's human nature. Right? So when uh, most of us are confronted with decisions to make in risk sensitive situations, we always evaluate from multiple perspectives. We just don't look at a number and make a decision. So this clearly states that we need something beyond just accuracy, which seems to be the be all and end all of all machine learning models as they have been formulated, right? It's not just, in fact, I was planning to come to this towards the end when we talk about open problems. Uh, it's not just about use of machine learning. The very formulations of machine learning use just an X and a Y if you consider supervised learning, which is data and a label. That's about it. There's no explanation, even in the very formulations of machine learning. But then in practice, we're asking these models not just to give a prediction uh, for a given uh, data point, but also explain the prediction for which we actually perhaps don't have data sets yet to derive such uh, insights. So uh, can existing machine learning models help us in this, uh, in this quest? So if you looked at most existing machine learning models, uh, it has been observed that there's almost a trade-off between interpretability on one axis and accuracy on the other axis. Traditional machine learning models like, say, linear regression or decision trees uh, are significantly interpretable. Right? So you, from linear regression, you can actually get the coefficient of each of your features in your model or decision trees give you rules. This is where I was coming to the an answer for the question that was asked. Let me complete this and answer that question. So decision trees also give you rules. right? So, But unfortunately, these kinds of models don't work as well when you have very large data sets in practice. On the other hand, support vector machines or neural networks, which are the more algorithms of choice today, neural networks in particular, unfortunately, they are the most black box and it's not easy to interpret them as to how a particular decision was arrived at when you use one of these models. So this trade-off is unfortunate and what we're really looking for 
is to go towards the, the top right of such a quadrant where you have models that are both accurate and interpretable. Once again, we need, we need multidimensional perspective to solve these problems. Now, coming back to the question that was asked, uh, that was asked a bit uh, earlier about rule mining and data mining. I mean, fundamentally, I think data mining and machine learning are slightly different. Data mining, you could say, is unsupervised. It's not predictive by nature. You're just probably mining relationships between variables in uh, in a large uh, in a large data set. So, in that sense, I think the premise is different. Uh, for the context of this tutorial, we are talking about predictive models and explaining predictive models. Right. So that's the context of this talk. So in that sense, rule mining from data mining methods are perhaps not directly uh, if fall into this uh, in this scope of discussion. However, decision trees are like rule based methods. Right? Unfortunately, they don't work as well when we consider large scale applications of data in the wild. They don't work just as well. One could consider random forests as perhaps an extension of decision trees that work in more large scale settings. So they are a bit more better in terms of their performance. Unfortunately, that comes at a cost of interpretability. You don't get the same level of interpretability with a random forest as you do with a decision tree. With a decision tree, your rules that are used for decision making are precise rules that you get once you build a tree. A random forest, you're going to have a bunch of different trees. You may get some rules from each of the trees. How do you combine them? You still have to rely on heuristics to be able to combine them. So you're not going to get very strong interpretability even from random forests. But if you look at the popular methods of choice, which are neural networks, at least for predictive models today, unfortunately, they're the least interpretable uh, in this particular context. I okay, hope I answered that question. If uh, perhaps who had asked the question, you have further question, please do feel free to ask again. Having said that, uh, now, uh, then where do you really need explainability? So actually, all applications in machine learning don't need explainability. I think it's important to realize that also. So for example, we all probably use machine learning in our spam filters or uh, say your product recommendation systems on Amazon or Flipkart or any of such uh, websites. So we are quite content with them. Maybe they get them, they get uh, your predictions wrong once a while, but we are actually okay with them. One of your emails doesn't go into spam. It's okay. We are able to deal with it and probably mark it as spam. So it really doesn't matter. So it's important to understand where explainability is required and where perhaps it's not. Currently, some of the domains where explainability is extremely useful, as, as, as I already mentioned, risk sensitive and safety critical. Okay, those are the domains where explainability is extremely useful. Uh, applications like aerospace or uh, I mean, any application related to space, aerospace, aviation, so on and so forth, explainability becomes very important. Infrastructure monitoring, right? So be it monitoring uh, railway tracks or be it inspecting bridges or be it inspecting roads across a, across a particular country. In all of these, explainability becomes very important. Insurance, the finance and insurance industry uh, is extremely, uh, I mean, relies on explainability for making a lot of these decisions. And finally, security, surveillance, and biometrics becomes another aspect where explainability becomes very important. In fact, I think there's been a, a very popular uh, case study which came up a few months or probably even a year ago where somebody was wrongly uh, sent to jail based on a software which was used. And when explainability was actually used to find out what was the reason for sending the person to jail, it was found that it was because of a bias in the data set. And the person was actually released from jail after a few years. Right? So these are very serious implications of using machine learning models in general, and explainability becomes extremely important in these scenarios. Uh, another thing to realize upfront with explainability, even before we go into technical details, is uh, explainability is uh, an aspect of AI and machine learning today, which lies at the interface of technology and humans. Right. So it's we live in a very interesting uh, world today where technology so to a certain extent has matured. If you look at the algorithms, machine learning, deep learning, all of these to a certain extent has matured. And the problems that are perhaps very relevant today, which are being discussed by researchers around the world, are ones that lie at the intersection of how technology interfaces with humans, be it fairness, be it uh, human computer interfaces, be it explainability, uh, be it transparency, be it ethical use, all of these are something that lie at the intersection of how AI is used with humans. So obviously then, even with explainability, depending on which human 
uses a particular model, what explanation means could mean different, different things. Right? So here is an example that was taken from a tutorial on, on uh, XAI. Uh, so if a business owner was using machine learning to make certain decisions for a business, the business owner may just want to know whether he or she can trust the decisions made by the made by the machine learning model. If it's a customer support agent who's probably using a chatbot and now want some explanations, they may want to know how do I answer this customer complaint? That's what a customer support may seek from an explainable chatbot, so to speak. A person working in IT ops may want to know how do I monitor and debug this model if it makes mistakes? That's what explainability could mean to them. For a data scientist, it could mean now how could I use this explainability to design a better model, right? So if I know that this is why a model was making this decision, and let's say the decision was wrong. Now the data scientist knows that perhaps something needs to be changed to improve the model and the decision making for those kinds of cases. And finally, uh, one of the most important aspects today, which is uh, the legal aspect for auditing and regulation purposes, are these AI system decisions fair? Once again, depends on explainability, right? So for example, if you take, uh, I talked about using machine learning for say, uh, giving out loans in a bank it's uh let's say a machine learning system is deployed and much later an explainable uh, explainability aspect is added to the system and it's now found that a specific machine learning model was using gender to decide whether a person should be given a loan or not given a loan clearly this violates perhaps uh, uh legal regulations and fair use of these kinds of approaches in general and based on that you probably need to take some decisions or action on the model being uh, deployed in that context. So explainability is useful in understanding how the model works, where the model is fair, where the model is not fair, and accordingly also interface with auditors and regulators in this particular context. So uh, what then does explainability really mean, right? So at the outset, I should mention uh, the notion of explanation is subjective. Right. inherently subjective right so how uh, what how somebody could explain something to me could differ from how somebody could explain the same concept to somebody else so explanation is inherently subjective so it's not trivial to formalize it and put it in one bin however there's an interesting paper that was published uh, about a couple of years ago called the challenge of crafting intelligible intelligence and they took a, a stab at how an end-to-end -end explainable vision system would look uh, in the future and this is a hypothetical example. So here you see the first step here is a typical supervised model that one would use deep learning for. Given an image, there is a machine learning classifier or a deep neural network that does classification and makes a prediction of a fish as corresponding to the image. Now, this is the basic supervised learning without any explainability. Now, let's look at the first degree of explanations that someone may be interested in. So human asks, why do you say so? And now the computer says see below and gives some kind of a heat map which shows which regions correspond to a fish and which regions correspond to a dog so the green regions here correspond to a fish the red regions correspond to a dog there's more green hence it must be a fish okay so this is what a lot of explainability methods do today they use things like gradients of a neural network so on and so forth to be able to generate such heat maps and then say that okay this part of the heat map corresponds to a fish and a significant part of the image <coughs> it now correlates to a fish and hence this must be a fish right so that's what a lot of these methods do today but we are not done now the human may ask okay i'm not very sure seems like it might just be recognizing anemone texture at this point in time <coughs> can you also tell me which training examples are most influential to the prediction excuse me let me get some water That. Just take a breather, uh, Vinith, yeah. And before you start, uh, there's also a question uh, where Sumanth Kulkarni asks, uh, are there biases in explainability and uh, if there are biases, can they cause <coughs> larger issues? Uh, just to repeat, can, are there biases, can there be biases in explainability and if there are biases, can they cause that can they cause larger issues? That's the question. Sure, thank you. Yeah, sorry about that again. So obviously, yes, I think uh, 
in fact this is one of the open problems i was about to come to towards the end is as much as we talk about bias in machine learning models bias can be in explainability methods too right so that is obviously an, a problem uh, in this space so that's at this point still remains an open problem so uh, i think this field is still nascent we still don't have clarity on uh, what exactly constitutes a good explanation a bad explanation i plan to talk about it over the next few slides so probably i'll answer this question as we go to but definitely yes i think that's a valid point and that i think that is an open problem at this point in time <coughs> okay uh, coming back to this example so now the human asks can you tell me which training examples are most influential to the prediction and now the computer or the machine learning system picks up some examples from the training set which are close to the given images and maybe now the human is a bit more convinced and now the human still continues to ask what happens if the background anemones are removed right and now the background anemones are removed only the fish remains and now the computer says i still predict fish because of these green super pixels maybe at this point the human is convinced and the interaction stops as you can see i mean now imagine a similar scenario with a radiologist using machine learning for say prediction of covid from chest x rays right so this is a very uh, very feasible scenario even in that very plausible scenario even in that context right a radiologist may look at maybe uh, we have a machine learning system that predicts a high risk of covid in a certain chest x ray maybe the radiologist will say no no now remove the left lung i want to see only the right lung do you still predict covid right remove the i mean you can do all of these interactions to trust your model so we probably are seeing uh, explainable systems moving towards more intractable uh systems where the human can ask questions and the system responds with answers that give uh, more and more trust in the system using iterative explanations this is at this point uh we are just envisioning how things look this is not necessarily the only future but this is at least looks like one plausible future where this field could go uh in in the years to come so in terms of what is being done itself right as i mentioned uh, a few minutes ago i think there has been immense amount of work in this space over the last few years so even within uh, uh within the scope of ai whether you talk about machine learning computer vision multi agent systems robotics search game theory planning the notion of explainability differs in machine learning often the question translates to which features are responsible for classification similarly in computer vision it could be which complex features are responsible for classification or in nlp it could be which entity is responsible for classification if you go to a topic like robotics it could be which decisions or combination of multimodal decisions led to a particular action if a robot chose a particular path to go from place a to place b why did it make that decision it may be important to perhaps plan paths for future robots that traverse a similar environment or if you have a planning context which actions are responsible for a plan if you have a search context which constraints can be relaxed or if you have a game theory context which combination of features is optimal so obviously uh, each such subfield of ai uh, the notion of explainability changes as you go forward because that's the nature of explanations which is subjective inherently and there has been a lot of work in each of these spaces over the last 5 6 years so one important thing to talk about before we go is uh, i think even uh, i myself are probably i'm using the word explainability a bit loosely and i don't think there is a very formal definition for explainability at this point in time which is uh, perhaps something of concern to the broader machine learning community also at this time but one general convention people use is to differentiate interpretability and explainability as i said this is just a convention okay so i don't think uh, this has to be followed always but i think it's useful to follow a certain convention to know that we are talking in the same language uh, by interpretability and explainability there are some subtle differences by interpretability we often refer to the ability to determine cause and effect from a machine learning model so for example we want to know which input feature resulted in a certain outcome right so uh, we also this is what we typically refer to as interpretability with the cause and effect aspect of uh, of a particular model whereas explainability is more about 
what a node represents in case of a neural network and its importance to the model's performance. Right? So we just want to know, given a model, so in some sense, explainability is more related to transparency. A model has been trained and it's being deployed. You want to know how it worked. Can the model explain itself as to how it arrived at its decision? That's what we mean by explanations. So on the other hand, if you look at decision trees or linear regression, we would call them interpretable models because we are directly defining or extracting some cause and effect relationships between input and output in these kinds of models. So linear regression would be a global interpretable model. You could have a local interpretable model where you could have varying coefficients for different segments of data. On the other hand, explanation methods would be more uh, some of the most common methods in this space are attribution methods. Attribution methods inherently mean how much did a particular input attribute to an output inside a given model. Given a trained model, how much did an input attribute to an output in that particular model? Okay, this is what we mean typically when we say attribution methods. They could be model agnostic where you don't depend on the underlying model. So irrespective of whether you use neural networks or support vector machines or uh, uh, or uh, k nearest neighbors, you have a method that can apply to any of those models. You could also have model specific methods where for a specific neural network or a specific method like random forest, you come up with a method that can give you some sense of attribution between an input and an output. Then you also have what are called as actionable explanations. Uh, this is something we won't get a chance to go into in this tutorial, but this is a, a pretty nascent and recent topic in this space called algorithmic recourse, where it's not only important to give explanations, it's also important to give actionable explanations. Let me give you an example there. Let's say we let's go back to the example of a customer being given a loan by a machine learning model that's deployed by a bank. So now uh, let's say a customer goes and asks the bank and the bank says that this is because of your credit score, right? So whatever the credit score system is in a particular country, the bank says because of your credit score, we are not able to give you a loan at this point in time. That's good. The customer gets an answer, but the customer still doesn't get an actionable answer to know when will I be eligible for a loan now? It's not just enough for me to know my credit score was responsible for the decision. I want to know my current current credit score is 650. If I reach 800, will I now get the loan? That's important for me. Right? Well, if I reach 725, will I get a loan? That's actually important for me. So it's not just important to give an explanation. It's important to give actionable explanations. And there is now these off late, there have been methods in this space uh, related to counterfactual explanations, algorithmic recourse, so on and so forth. In addition, one could also categorize existing methods in explainability as uh, post hoc versus anti hoc. This is, I think, an important categorization. Post hoc methods are where you already have a trained model. Let's assume a company or uh, an institution or an organization has already deployed a machine learning model. Now they don't want to touch it. It's already a model that works. They don't want to retrain. They don't want to apply a different method or an algorithm to solve the problem. It works well in practice. So what they do if somebody wants explainability is to add another method that can sit as a layer around the machine learning method and be able to explain the decision of the original machine learning model. This is the most popular approach today. Most of the methods that we will discuss, in fact, over the next, say, half an hour will be post hoc methods where we try to explain the decisions of a trained model. But ideally, this is clearly this is not ideal. You want anti hoc explainable methods where the model is explainable by design, right? So uh, I think uh, generally anti hoc methods are more interpretable than explainable because you directly learn those relationships between input and output. An example of anti hoc methods could be a decision tree right? because while learning the model itself, the rules on explaining the decision become evident as part of the model building itself. That's the reason why they're called anti hoc methods. Similarly, you could have model agnostic methods, where, as I already mentioned, uh, the models, uh, the explainability methods don't depend on the underlying model or model dependent methods where it depends on the underlying model. You could also have what are called global explanation methods versus local explanation methods. In global explanation methods, the explanation is for an entire population. For example, I may want to know uh, for a given city. So I'm currently located in Hyderabad. So I want to know uh, 
why is what's the what's the implication of a particular patient characteristic on say covid risk right i would i may want to get this explanation across the population so such explanations are global explanations on the other hand i may want an explanation for the risk predict profiling of a patient for a specific patient at a specific point in time that we refer to as a local explanation for a given data sample okay so there are methods for both of these kinds today uh, across the different uh, explainability methods that have been proposed so with that basic uh, motivation and overview for explainability in general let's probably step in into one level of technical detail and talk about uh, explainability in deep learning which is the focus of today's tutorial and talk about attribution methods which are used for deep learning today right as as i already mentioned attribution methods are uh, are those where given a trained model we try to understand what is the effect of an input on the output in a trained model okay that's what we are looking for maybe let me pause here for questions are there any questions so far before i step into exactly uh, there's one uh vinny so himanshu pant uh, asked uh it's it's a question of how prepared you are in the uh, in the presentation so he asked whether the interpretability was accuracy trend that you showed earlier in the presentation uh is it based on some particular algo algorithm like sharp line mimic etc so uh, so this has been a general trend of observation so it's not uh, that particular graph is not a, a plot of data it's a general understanding it's just a it's more a visualization than a specific plot of data but this is a general observation in the field at this point in time that as you try to in fact if you uh, look at uh, models that are inherently explainable you would actually see i mean you can probably take recent papers that have been published or the in fact i think even neurips had some papers in the space you'll actually see that papers that uh, included explanations while learning losing out on some accuracy by some a, a point or two but then the argument of these kinds of efforts is that but we are adding another dimension which is useful right so it just seems to be empirical observation at this point across different methods so this is not that plot was not for a particular method it was just a visualization so but this seems to be an observation across the community at this point in time that as you go for more interpret interpretability somehow accuracy is getting affected so this is definitely something that we don't expect so if you uh, perhaps think deeper one would expect that if you have very interpretable models you should actually generalize well right so that's what one would expect uh, when you think of it in intuitively but it's clearly not happening in practice to some especially with deep learning right especially with deep learning this is something that's not happening in practice so one could also relate this discussion to probably things like adversarial robustness and adversarial perturbations and things like that right so we also notice that a small perturbation in input completely changes the output everybody understands that as a huge security issue at this point in time that space of adversarial attacks and defenses has been immense in the last few years it's for similar reasons if you look at it right so if a small change can lead to a huge a small change in input can lead to a huge change in output clearly something is wrong which means the models as such are not learning the kind of rules we want them to learn right so which is what is perhaps the trade off that's reflected in interpretability with accuracy too we would expect that if models are more interpretable they would generalize better but it just doesn't seem to happen with deep learning models at this point in time so clearly not ideal but that's what is empirical observation at this point in time we hope that so uh thank you vinit for the for the very uh elaborate answer and a very good answer so i think that answer also answers uh, also satisfies yashaswini vishwanath who asked uh, will trying to improve explainability reduce the performance of neural networks so i think that's answered uh, there is one manoj agarwal who's asking uh, all the examples we used had one or two variables explaining a decision like gender or credit card score or whatever are there more complex explain explainability scenarios where one or two variables may not explain the outcome any ex examples of that type absolutely i think uh, in fact probably over the next few slides you'll see quite a few and the simplest example for uh, answering that question is an image right an image even if you take a 1 megapixel image has probably 10 par 6 pixels that you're dealing with right so uh, 
you uh, when we talk about attribution in an image we are talking about how relevant a pixel was towards a particular outcome right right away there your variables are 10 par 6 you're not talking about two variables or three variables anymore it it's not just image you could talk about nlp where you have a document i'll probably you'll see some of these examples over the next few slides where you can look at the contribution of different words towards probably associating a certain sentiment with the document or uh, it could be in terms of speech all of these spaces also have a similar issues so it's not just about uh, uh, two variable or three variable spaces definitely you it the same discussion holds even for uh, data with larger number of variables having said that i think maybe there is an implicit question in what you're trying to ask is what if variables are correlated right so that's again a fundamental issue so maybe this is these are some open i think a lot of these questions are probably open problems in this space so when your variables are correlated probably explanations make sense when you use a subset of variables to explain a particular outcome rather than explain variable by variable so in fact a very active uh, research area in deep learning today is what is known as disentanglement right how do you disentangle the latent variables that may be generating a particular data right so that's an active area of research so only if you disentangle in a way in which variables are not correlated your explanations can then be articulated in terms of individual variables the moment there's correlation you may have to explain in terms of subsets of variables which may be something that you're also trying to ask but i think otherwise all of these discussions hold even for large number of variables so there's one more question by sumant uh, who asked whether interpretability and explainability are mutually exclusive in terms of the techniques that we use or can we have modeling methods where both can be achieved um i think in some sense an interpretable method is inherently explainable because the interpretability gives you the explanation as is but there are some subtle differences i mean i do want to mention that this is not like a i wouldn't say these are very formal definitions as i said this is just a convention at this point in time and as i said the, the field is nascent i think you may find in a different talk a different speaker completely saying it giving a different definition for interpretability and explainability explainability so in fact uh, one of the keynote speakers for cords is cynthia rudin i think she received what is known as the ai squirrel award for her work in this space uh, uh, very recently and uh, she in fact uh, differentiates interpretable and explainable methods as ante hoc versus post hoc right interpretable methods according to her are where the interpretations are baked while learning where are explainability methods are inherently post hoc explainable expl explanation so there is some variations in how these terminologies are used having said that in the context in which uh, i have been talking about these terms in her in interpretability in some sense automatically ensures explainability not the other way around but there is a difference when we talk about explainability we may also be interested in how an intermediate variable say in a neural network we may be interested in how an intermediate neuron in a in one of the hidden layers what is the attribution of that neuron on the output this has nothing to do with interpretability it has nothing to do with the relationship between input and output it may just be useful for some kind of analysis right so it's common these days to visualize feature maps of intermediate layers of a convolutional neural network so on and so forth so in that context explanation uh, is about transparency right it's about understanding how much attribution any node in a neural network has on an output including input nodes so there's a more broad definition there if you see that way so there is uh, some overlap there's also perhaps some uh, mutual exclusion there hope i answered that question great uh just one more question that go there're going to be many many questions i'm sure so sure. what about data being used uh being biased rather than the techniques uh so that's that's the question so uh, uh so the thing is uh am, am i getting the question right so it it says uh, what about the data being used being uh, biased uh, rather than the uh, algorithm and how do we deal with uh, data biases sure sure so in fact i mean explainability is one way of detecting bias right so if you think through carefully i think i gave this example uh, a few minutes ago too is uh, 
let's assume there was a machine learning system that's deployed, that's giving out loans to consumers. And let's say it's been deployed, right? So let's say it's already, in fact, many banks around the world, including India, use this already to give instant approval of loans and so on. So machine learning is already used and nobody's probably investigated them. And suppose you use explainability methods and check how decisions are being arrived at for different customers. And you find that gender is one of the important factors. Then what could that mean? It simply means that when the model was built, the data set had perhaps a bias in terms of gender. Otherwise, the model is not going to learn that bias, right? The model learns the bias from a data set. So then perhaps it may be important to revisit that data set. It may just be possible. I mean, just for as an example, that in that data set, there was a certain gender that probably didn't close all their loans on time. And that's the reason why gender was being used in the model while making these decisions. So in some sense, explanation methods can become useful in detecting such biases in data sets. So they are interlinked here, right? So it's not like, uh, so data set bias results in model bias and explainability methods can help you detect these in practice. Go on, Vineet. So I'll, I'll stop you later to answer. Sure, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Very much, very much. So the next segment perhaps is going to be a little semi-technical. So we'll talk about some of these attribution methods that are used specifically in deep learning. Right? So I think that's the flavor of the day today. So we'll probably focus on that and talk about a few methods that are being used uh, around the world. But before I go and talk into methods, a more fundamental question is how do you evaluate explainable methods? Right. So before we talk about methods, it's important to know what is a good method. Right? Then only you can appreciate the method uh, per se. So which this is inherently a big problem for the field, right? So to this day, we don't have objective measures for capturing explainability for obvious reasons, because neither do data sets that we have created have objective explanations, which you can perhaps verify and validate. We don't have that. All data sets uh, for supervised learning just have data and labels. We don't have explanations to verify. So how do you really study the goodness of explanations? So over the years, people have come up with various heuristics that can be used. And one such heuristics that's quite common, it has a few different flavors, but most of them use the same core idea, which is what is known as perturbation based methods. So once you have an explainability method or an attribution method that tells you that these are the features in your input that are responsible for a certain outcome. Okay, let's say that that has been obtained from an explainability method. If you want to validate it, if you want to study it, what you can do is take the top k features that that explainable method gave you, perturb them and see what is the change in the output, right? If higher the change, that means better the method that gave us that attribution, right? If the top k features result in a higher change, that means we are looking at the right features that are most influential for that particular model under question. So this is often plotted as an area under perturbation curve. So where you keep changing the K that you use to perturb and see how much the prediction changes for the top K perturbations. So if you see that the area under perturbation curve is high, you know that you're doing well in terms of identifying the right features that are attribute that are uh, attributing the most for a given model. Okay, so this is one metric people use with a few different variations. So what perturbation means means different things in different data sets in an image. It may be about occluding different parts of an image in a document. It could be about replacing a few words in a document with some common words in a speed signal. It could be about replacing a few parts of a speed signal with some uh, white noise or just some of from a zero, uh, a zero signal, so on and so forth. Or if you have tabular data, it could be about taking a particular value and replacing it with some small Gaussian noise or something like that. Right? So all of the perturbation depends on a particular application under question. The other popular way of evaluating explainability methods is using humans. Okay, so once you have uh, an explanation for a given prediction, you probably have 20 or 30 people or 100 people uh, looking at that prediction and explanation. And uh, now you ask them questions whether the explanation was satisfying to their uh, for that particular prediction was the response time satisfactory, so on and so forth. Right? So in fact, there's a nice paper a couple of years ago, which tried to uh, study this and evaluation of the human interpretability of explanation. And they talk about uh, how human evaluation can be used for predictive models, especially in NLP. Okay, so this is a nice paper that did something like that. 
more fundamentally speaking the moment you bring humans into the question when you talk about explainable uh, explainability methods there's a nice paper called explain explanation in ai insights from social sciences which goes ahead and looks at papers from cognitive psychology social science so on and so forth on what explanations mean to humans in general right so in fact they argue that attributions need not mean explanations at all right so which is true too right so it depends on uh, which human is sitting on the other end of a particular system so they talk about truth and probability being important factors truth is how correct the explanation is probability is how probably right how many times was the explanation correct that's the probability aspect of it how useful is the explanation how relevant <coughs> is the explanation for a given task how coherent is the explanation with some prior belief in a particular domain or also how generalizable is a given application for a population or a data set data subset right so these are all different factors that one could think of and use for a given application which one do you use depends on what user is uh, is using that particular explanations for decision making and what application domain is being looked at for that particular problem there is also a completely different way of explaining i think we also talked about it when we talked about envisioning uh, xai systems are explanations by examples right so sometimes you may just not need attributions to explain you may not just need to know which input features are responsible for an outcome you may just want to explain by an example if somebody asks me why do i call this a cat i may say look at that image and that image and that image you told me that they're all cats hence this must be a cat right so it's possible to explain using examples too so in fact uh, this particular study which was published in iclear of 2021 uh, concluded that explaining by examples are actually often better than explaining by attributions i think you have to take these studies i also think with some context and uh, uh, and make your own conclusions but in their particular context they said that examples are often better for explanations than using attribution methods so it's also important to consider that perspective there has also been work on trying to look at explanations in different fields trying to study different evaluation criteria right i'm not going to get into the details of this particular paper here but this particular paper tried to look at different domains ranging from finance to facial recognition to healthcare uh, these were the objectives that were uh, that were studied for each of the models in these sectors the explainability technique that was used uh, is what you see in this column who were the stakeholders that were the users of the system and what was the evaluation criteria that was used in each of these is nicely summarized in this particular table right so if you're interested you can look at this paper to probably see uh, what may be relevant say to your context right so this paper was called explainable machine learning in deployment so having just seen those uh, few ways of evaluating uh, attribution methods let's actually go ahead and talk about some of these attribution methods uh, at this point in time maybe let me pause here if there are any more questions before going into some technical details of these methods any questions at this time questions have come up so uh okay let me let me just uh yeah just just give me a minute so sure, sure, there yeah. are some on the q and a this some on the chat so i'll have to figure out so let's see uh high predictability implies low accuracy what does it mean from liability perspective are there any metrics that balance the two that is both predictable predictability as well as accuracy i think he means explainability and accuracy yeah i was probably confused so uh, sorry can you i got confused with predictability there what uh, so what was the question there again i i guess what uh, accenture guess that's the name so uh, uh, is asking is high explainability means low accuracy this is what you no, had uh, correct, mentioned yes. a few minutes back what does it mean from a liability perspective are there any metrics that balance these two uh sure so so which as i said this is the pursuit right so at this point in time which is which is why i said uh, this is the motivation for this entire work at this point in time so people do use so if you had say explainability as one performance metric that you're using for a given application and accuracy is another metric you could probably look at the harmonic mean of the two of them and then say that that is the metric that i'm going to use at the same time perhaps it's not that one dimensional right so 
sometimes it may not be necessary to just use one metric to make a decision. Sometimes just look, looking at them as two different metrics and making decisions may be as useful. In that sense, it may not be about combining metrics. You can look at each of those metrics as is and make your decisions too, right? So uh, it depends. I think it depends on, again, once again, which user is using it and what application is, is this being used for. So you could simplify whenever you have multiple metrics to take a harmonic mean of those metrics. Like say we use F1 score for precision and recall. So it's a common metric that people use to get a single number from precision and recall. Similarly, if you had a single score, let's say the area under perturbation curve for explainability and accuracy for uh, prediction, then you could take a harmonic mean and make your decisions. But I think it, it depends on whether what is important for a given application and accordingly make your decisions as to uh, which metric to use. Uh, okay, the next question comes from Prajwal Chandrasekharaya, uh, who's asking, I mean, you've shown this uh, perturbation curve some time back, uh, and you said that uh, if we identify the top K features, so he's asking, how do we identify the top K features? So as I mentioned, we will see that. I think the next few slides are exactly about attribution methods. There are methods that identify attribution. Attribution is how much does an input feature contribute towards an output? That's what we define as attribution. So you would get that for every feature in your data set. If it's tabular data, you will get that for every feature. If it's an image, you'll get it for every pixel. If it's a document, you'll get it for every word. If it's a graph, you'll get it for every node, so on and so forth. So you get that for every feature. And now you pick the top K features which had the highest importance. Right? So how do you get that importance? I'll talk about in the next few slides. So uh, there's Mandar Kulkarni who is asking a very interesting question. So he says, since with adversarial ex examples, there is a small change in the input that results in a large change in the output. So are those models which are more prone to adversarial attacks better explainable? Okay, it's a very nice question. In fact, many of, I was about to talk about this in our ongoing work. We have quite a few papers in that space, in fact. So there's a close connection, right? So I actually think it's the other way. I mean, uh, models that are prone to adversarial attacks are perhaps less explainable, right? Because they're very, very sensitive to input, right? You don't, you want a certain amount of robustness, right? So let me give you uh, an example here, right? So one of the popular examples people give for adversarial attacks and perturbations is you take an image of a cat, you change a couple of pixels. Now the model predicts as an ostrich, right? So this is a standard example people give. So uh, if you were using explanations here, if a model, if there was an explainability method that could explain why a model called an image of a cat as a cat, if you change two pixels in it, there is no way any explainable method can give any sane explanation of how it became an ostrich. Right? So clearly, explanations and adversarial attacks are complementary. There is a connection between them. Right? So one would expect that if models are more robust to adversarial attacks, they are probably more, they have more consistent explanations. On the other hand, in fact, it's a very popular trend today. There are multiple papers in this space where people regularize for explanations and show that the models have become adversarially more robust. Okay, that both ways. There are papers that kind of show both ways at this point in time. But that's an interesting connection. Wonderful. Okay, so there's just, let's just take one more question right now. Sure, sure. So there's Guta Jayakrishna who is asking, considering multiple non-linearities of deep neural networks, how does one entangle these non-linearities non and get the explanations for deep NNs. <clears throat> sure. I think probably to some extent the question is boiled down to, boiling down to how do the attribution methods work. So maybe let me step into that detail now. Maybe we can take some of these questions again after I finish the next segment. Because I think the answer to that question would be for me to explain how these attribution methods work. Okay, so maybe uh, let me go ahead and step into the next segment. And once yes. we finish that, we'll uh, come back to this question if it still doesn't answer. Perfect. So uh, as I already mentioned, attribution methods fall under explanation methods. You can see it here in the graph that I, in this chart that I showed a bit earlier. So over the last few years, there have been multiple methods that have been proposed. So I'm going to revisit uh, visit a few of them, which are commonly used and talk about how they work in practice, right? I may not go into the math of each of them, but I'll at least talk about them at an intuitive level, given the limited time. 
So one of the earliest methods that was proposed for explanations or attributions in neural networks or probably any machine learning model was a method called LIME. Okay, LIME stands for Local Interpretable Model Agnostic Explanations. This was published in KDD of 2016. And uh, one of the reasons I picked this method is it's very, very popularly used. I personally know of uh, industries that have deployed this in practice also. And it's the code is available. Plenty of people that use this for and it's heavily cited as a paper also. So, in fact, they have a pretty interesting motivation for this work in their uh, in their paper, and it may be worth visit, visiting that to talk about the trade-off that I talked about earlier, the accuracy versus interpretability trade-off that I talked about. Since there were a few questions on that, this example nicely illustrates that issue, right? So, uh, so this is a particular example that they show from their paper. They train a random forest on the popular news groups dataset, which has about twenty news groups of different. Uh, emails that are sent to different distribution lists and categorizing them as belonging to say sports this is politics this is atheism this is christianity so on and so forth and they have a particular random forest model which gives a test accuracy of 92 percent which is considered a decent accuracy remember this work is about six years old so you can imagine that was a decent accuracy at that point in time for this particular model on that data set so when they actually once they came up with their method when they investigated Okay, as to what was happening. So they considered a particular email here. And this particular email was correctly classified by the model as belonging to atheism, right? correctly classified. The probabilities were 0.58 versus 0.42 for Christianity. And it correctly classified the post as belonging to atheism. So you would think that 92% accuracy is correctly classifying all well and good. Okay. But when they investigated, which words in the email were responsible for, for this particular outcome, they found that the words that were highlighted, so this is where attribution comes in, right? So different words in the document, they got the attribution for each of those words and they have now highlighted the top K attributions. And they found that the words that were most attributed for this particular classification was EDU, NNTP, posting, host, there have, have and have. None of these have anything to do with atheism. But these were the reasons the model classified this particular email as belonging to the atheism category. Why? Because in the data set, most of such emails were belonging to the atheism category. Just pure spurious correlation in the data set resulted in the model deciding that whenever it sees these words, it should now classify as belonging to atheism. Here is a model, high accuracy, poor interpretability. Right. So this is the trade off that we're talking about. Right. So this is exactly this is what they try to highlight through their work and through their method. How does their method work? So here is the intuition. I'm showing it with an image example, but this can be done with any other data. Also, you can do it with a tabular data, graph, document, any other data too. So once you've trained a model, remember, this is a post hoc method, which means you're going to use this to explain a previously trained model. You're not training. It's already trained. Okay. So you have a trained deep neural network that given this image predicts tree frog for this particular image with a probability of 0.54. Okay, that's the right answer. And it gives a probability of 0.54. That's already there. Now you want to explain why did the model predict this particular image as belonging to a tree frog? So what Lime suggests is you now perturb your data and get multiple perturbed instances, right? In an image, Perturbances mean, perturbations mean that you take an image and now occlude different parts of the image. Right? So that's what perturbations mean. Now, for each of these perturbed instances, you propagate these instances through the same neural network. And you now look at what is the prediction probability for a tree frog. You see that when only the face is given, the prediction probability goes up to 0.85. When different parts of the tree frog, random parts of the tree frog are presented, the prediction probability goes down to 10 power minus 5. When you have the full tree frog, it predicts the tree frog with probability 0.52. Right? You just occlude some parts of the background. You see that the probability is at 0.52. Okay. So now you have a new, so to speak, data set. This data set is these perturbed instances and their corresponding probabilities. What they do now is to fit a linear regression model on this data set. Once you fit a linear regression model on this data set, remember linear regression gives you weights of every feature 
towards the prediction. You now get the weight of every input pixel towards the prediction and that tells you which input pixels were most responsible for this particular prediction in this particular example. And after building the regression model, they uh, conclude that the head region was the reason why this particular model predicted this as a tree frog. So what is happening here? They are now assuming that whatever function a deep learning model takes, uh, it could be a very complex function. Right? What they're trying to do is to say that now let's take a local linear approximation of that model, which is obtained by the linear regression model. How do you get the local linear approx approximation? Take a point on that particular function, take its nearest neighbors by perturbations of that data point. Now build a line through it, take a linear regression model through it. Now the coefficients of that line give you the importance of different features on the output. Now use that to make a local explanation for that particular input. Remember, you have to do this kind of a linear regression for every test data point separately. Okay, so that's the flip side here, but because linear regression is fast, it does work well in practice. Okay. What if your data was not an image? What if it was tabular data? You take your data point and every feature you give, add some Gaussian noise to it, right? Or if it's a document, for every word, you probably replace it by some other word or add some noisy word or so on and so forth. So these perturbed instances have to be obtained in different ways for different data types. But then for every input, you build such a local data set around the data point, which consists of perturbed instances and the probability of predicting the class under question. Remember, this was the winning class for this image. You only want an explanation for why did the model call this image as belonging to a tree frog? And that answer is given by a local linear regression model, which gives the explanation. Very simple approach. The name says it all. It is local. It's defined for every point separately. It is model agnostic. It does not matter whether the model was a neural network or an SVM or a k-nearest neighbor. Whatever it is, you perturb the instance and ask the model to give the prediction for the same class. Now, that's all. It doesn't matter what the model was. It's model agnostic and it is a post hoc method. So that's why it's called line and it's very, very popular in terms of practical use in different, different applications. Okay, this is one of the most popular methods that are used. Another popular method that was used is one of the earlier methods again is known as LRP or layer wise relevance propagation. What this method tries to uh, do is they talk about this in the context of a neural network and they say that to understand the attribution of any input or any node in a neural network on the output, Let's try to get a sense of how relevant that node was towards getting a certain output. How do you get that relevance? So they come up with a formula that is obtained when you uh, back propagate from the output. So if you want to understand the relevance of the last layer's neurons on the output, that relevance would be given by something like this. They have a few different formulas in their paper, but you have AIWIJ plus A, AI here is the activation of a neuron in a particular layer. WIJ is the weight connecting that neuron to the, to the last layer. And then you normalize it by the activations and the weights of all the neurons in that particular layer that contributed towards the neuron in the next layer. Right? The, the denominator is simply a normalizer. And this fraction of the overall relevance is the relevance of that neuron towards the output. And once you have a relevance for each of these neurons in the final layer, now you can compute the relevance of the neurons in the previous layer using similar formula and you keep uh, working backwards to get the relevance of each neuron towards the output. That's how they get attributions. Now you can get all, you can go all the way to the input layer to, found, to find the attribution of an input towards the output. They have a few variations of this formula depending on if you use a batch normalization layer in between the formula slightly changes, so on and so forth, right? So based on what is being used in a neural network, the formula slightly changes, but this is the overall idea. In fact, they all, they go on to show that this kind of an approach is similar to doing a Taylor series decomposition or an approximation of first order approximation of the function that each neuron models in this particular case. This is one other method. So there's a website called heatmapping.org where the code for this method is publicly available and they have a lot of examples of how this method works in practice. Another method that was proposed in ICML of 2017, which is also used often, is known as 
deep lift. This has an interesting premise. Right? So as you can see here, this notion of relevance of a, new, a node in a neural network towards the output is similar to the notion of a gradient. Right? There are subtle differences. I want to get, get into those details now. But it's similar to the notion of a gradient. Right? Gradient effectively means is what gradient effectively is, is like attribution. If I change the input by a small amount, how much does the output change? That's the first principle's definition of a gradient, which is similar to attribution. We are trying to ask a similar question for attribution, although a gradient only refers to one local vicinity of a given value. Right? So, but it's similar to an attribution. So what deep lift method tries to say is that gradient can be sensitive depending on which region of input you're evaluating the gradient. Right? If you use a sigmoid activation, when you have the saturation region of the sigmoid activation, uh, if you change the input by a small amount, the output of the sigmoid activation won't change at all. Right? So if you go off towards the saturation region of a sigmoid, changing the input by, a, by even a large amount will not lead to a significant change in your sigmoid activation. So that is inherently limiting whenever you compute a gradient. So what they say in this particular approach is that instead of computing a gradient, you must always compute attribution with, with respect to a reference value. So if you're given a certain, let's say, for example, you have a patient and you want to predict the risk of, say, a heart attack or COVID, right? So if the patient presents themselves with, say, a blood pressure of 160 by 100, okay, what gradient would do is to change the blood pressure to 161 and see what happens to the output, change the blood pressure to 101 and see what happens to the output, and then say this is the attribution of blood pressure towards the risk of say a heart attack. But we all know that blood pressure has a reference value 120 by 80. Perhaps we should do the gradient with respect to the reference value rather than an infinitesimal change. So you should probably check if the same patient had presented themselves with 120 by 80, what would have been the risk of say a heart attack or COVID. And that would tell us how important blood pressure is for that patient in predicting the risk. So there is a reference value rather than making a small change in the input that is used while computing the gradient. This is the main intuition for the deep lift method that's proposed. So based on this approach, they use a few different rules called linear rule, rescale rule, reveal cancel rule, so on and so forth to compute the contributions of each node in a neural network towards the output. But all of these have the same premise that you should not be using gradients, but you should be using a reference value while making these computations of contributions of an input towards an output. Uh, another way of uh, obtaining, as I already mentioned, is using the gradient itself, right? So this is where methods such as CAM or GradCAM, which is very popular. So we had our work called GradCAM++, which sits on top of GradCAM, which is also popularly used. All of them try to use gradients to obtain this information of attribution, right? So if you have an image, if I try to find out uh, which input pixel uh, had the highest attribution towards the output. If I want to find that out, I could get that by using the gradient of the loss with respect to X. Remember when we train a neural network, we compute the gradient of the loss with respect to the weights. We compute say dou L by dou W to, to update the weights of a neural network. You could use the same chain rule to compute dou L by dou X. And once you do that, you now have an understanding of how much an input feature changes with respect to the output. Remember, all of these methods are post hoc methods. We are doing this after training a model. So computing this can be done because we already have a trained model. In that trained model, we have to compute dou L by dou X using chain rule. Simple, right? So that's what is done in all of these methods that use gradients. So if you've heard words like uh, CAM, GradCAM, GradCAM++, all of them use this kind of an approach while com computing the attribution of an input pixel on the output. A method that had an interesting take on the notion of gradients is a method called integrated gradients, which is a very popular uh, method for, uh, for many attribution methods here, not just for images, but even for other kinds of data. What they argue is that gradients, as I already mentioned, are in inherently sensitive to where you're measuring the gradient. Right? So if you have an X, you perturb the X and make it X plus delta X and see how much the model function that you've learned using a neural network changes. That's the definition of gradient, right? 
that's very sensitive to where that x is and whether the function is sensitive to, to that delta x for that particular x value. So they instead say that you must replace the computation of the gradient by what they call as an integrated gradient or a path gradient. So what they do here is if you have an image, you now consider a simple black image, okay, just a black image. Now take all possible interpolations between the black image and a given image. So you have an image, you have a black image. Now interpolate the two, which means you just add some linear combination of black image and the original image. It will be like almost taking an image and fading it to black, right? You'll get all of those images in between as your different images. Now for each of those images on that path, compute your gradients and add them all up to get an integrated gradient. They say that computing the gradient that way is more robust than computing the gradient only in the original image. Okay, this kind of a path gradient is called as the integrated gradient. The integrated is because you're integrating it over, over a bunch of different images on which you're computing the gradient. In addition to uh, giving this method, this particular paper also introduced some things called axioms of attribution. They showed that any attribution method that you use in practice must satisfy certain properties. These properties are known as completeness, sensitivity, implementation invariance, symmetry preservation, linearity, so on and so forth. Right? I'm not going to get into those details, but this is just to tell you that people have been trying to uh, come up with formalizations where these kinds of methods should satisfy certain properties, which you can then compare different methods against. Okay, see, there's, these are known as axioms of attribution and many methods today try to uh, check whether any new method uh, satisfies these axioms in practice or not. Another such method is known as smooth grad, where they do a method similar to integrated gradients, but what they do is to not do it using uh, a path of different images. Instead, what they do is simply add Gaussian noise to different copies of the image and average the resulting gradients. Very, very simple method. You take an image, you compute the gradient to get the attribution of an input on the output. Now you add various kinds of noise to the input image and keep computing the gradients for all of these noisy images. Now average out your gradients across all of these noisy images. You get a smooth saliency map across uh, uh, across all of these noisy images and that's the final attribution or saliency map that you're going to use as attribution in this particular context okay so all of these methods to a certain extent used some notion of gradient or relevance or things like that to understand what attribution is a completely different family of methods are based on shapley values from game theory right uh, Shapley value was developed by a person called Lloyd Shapley. Interestingly, a lot of these discussions here actually uh, resulted in Turing Awards in the last decade. Lloyd Shapley won a Turing Award in 2011, I guess, for his work called Shapley values. So Shapley values is a game theoretical concept. And the way it connects to attribution or explainability is Shapley values simply tries to find out that in game theory, let's say you have uh, Messi who's playing for uh, uh, a Barcelona or a Real Madrid or, or say uh, you have Ronaldo who's playing for Juventus or Manchester United, you want to find out how valuable, how what is the attribution of Ronaldo to the success of Manchester United in their wins. Let's say that's what the attribution actually is, right? The importance of an input feature on the output. In football, it could be about how many wins or how many goals scored or things like that. So then what you try to do is you construct all possible teams and see if you add Ronaldo to it, how much does the success rate change? You take a team of two people, add Ronaldo to it, see how much does the success rate change. You, you take a team of three people, add Ronaldo to it, see how much the success rate change. And then you average out all these possible combinations and that tells you the value or the attribution or the contribution of a player towards a team. The same analogy or uh, idea is used to apply this for explanations. If you have different features in your input data, then you try to consider what you take all positive, all different features and see if you add this particular feature to that correlation of features, how much does the prediction change when you add this particular feature to the input? Okay. And then you average out over all possible combinations of features in a given input. Obviously, as you can see, 
this becomes a combinatorial problem. If you have a large number of features, computing Shapley values becomes a problem. But this is possibly one approach to computing attribution using this kind of an approach. So this was pioneered by uh, Scott Lundberg in a paper in Europe of 2017, where this particular value function that you see here, which comes from game theory, was replaced by the deep lift attribution in this particular approach. And using this, uh, he came up with deep shap that was used to compute attribution of an input feature towards the output. Okay, those are different technical methods that have been used. The pop I've only visited popular ones. There are tons more that we haven't had a chance to talk about. But those are the popular methods and the idea behind these popular methods. Maybe let me, I know we are probably five minutes away from uh, close of the session. Uh, the next two, ses next two sections are brief. They are high-level overviews. So maybe we can take a few questions at this time before going to the conclusion of this tutorial. Any Great. Okay. So I'll just start. Uh, maybe three questions at this time. So where does uh, mimic learning or extraction methods sit in the explainability domain? Under what category or condition do we prefer using the same? This is what Debanjan Sadhu Khan uh, asks. So, uh, sorry, uh, mining methods? What was the... what? Kind where, of... where does mimic learning or extraction methods? That's what he's asking. Okay, I'm not very aware what you mean by mimic. I don't know if it's imitation learning. I probably am not very aware of what uh, mimic learning method means. But if you mean by extraction methods, if you mean uh, rule extraction methods, then I probably already answered that question. So they are uh, like decision trees and so on and so forth. I'm not very sure if I get what mimic learning means. Uh, I, I probably don't get that question clearly. Okay, the next one is uh, from Anshul Bansal, who asks, with post hoc explainability, we are using one system to explain another. Uh, so how does one go about eval evaluating the explain explainability systems for reliability? Absolutely. So this is one of the uh, bullet points in my open problems and challenges, in fact. In fact, I think this is going to become a problem even more and more as we go. So as much as I said, that post-hoc methods are the popular ones. Right? So far over the last few years, everybody has tried to see how do I not change my ML infrastructure and add explainability to it. That has been the focus over the last few years. But over the last year or two, there has been a lot of focus on trying to build models that are inherently explainable. I do think that would be the solution going forward because otherwise what could happen now is if there was a team that developed the machine learning model from Infosys for the bank in Germany that we talked about in the beginning, and there was another team that developed the explainability model. Now the question will become whom to sue, right? If something goes wrong, whom to sue is going to become a problem. If something went wrong with explanation, was the explainability method wrong or did the original model learn some long, wrong correlations? It's difficult to isolate. We still don't know the answer, right? So I think the only answer at this point in time is that going for methods that are inherently interpretable, which are anti hoc methods, are perhaps the way to go. But having said that, I think the easier way to go over the last few years has been to add a layer of explainability, which perhaps uh, addresses the problem to a certain extent. But I definitely think that's a major problem going forward. And we do need methods that learn explanations along with prediction. There are methods, uh, even with deep learning in that space over the last few years. Uh, the next question is a technical one. Uh, why is noise most often not Gaussian? Okay, I think that's a very fundamental question of statistics, I would say. So I think it's 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 a bit uh, strange. I think that Gaussian noise is perhaps the most common noise that everybody uses in practice. Uh, when I say practice, I mean while probably developing a model or working with a model. But yes, that's true that perhaps in the real world, things are not really Gaussian always, right? So why is it so? I'm not sure. I think it, I don't have a clear answer. I remember uh, reading a book many, many years ago on this exact question, uh, but not necessarily in a machine learning context. I don't recall the book's name at this point. It's over a decade now. But uh, uh, I, I, I'm not sure. I think it depends on the nature of data. But for a large part of real data uh, when i say real data i mean data in the real uh, in a real space right i don't mean discrete data in a continuous space adding gaussian noise seems to add value when you work with data right so if you have uh, say images you add some gaussian noise to it uh, 
it does seem to add some level of robustness. Whether that's the ideal level of robustness, whether noise is really Gaussian or not, we still don't know. But do working with these kinds of Gaussian noise does seem to add some level of robustness in practice. And that's why people continue to use it from an implementation standpoint. I do agree that perhaps in the real world, not all noise is always Gaussian. Why so? Uh, I think it, it's the nature of data. I don't think I have a clear answer for that at this point. So Ashish Kulkarni asks, debugging neural networks seems like an important uh, application of explainable AI. What techniques would you re recommend for this during deep learning model development? Sorry, what was the question again? Deep? Uh... Yeah. So he says, deep uh, debugging neural networks. Debugging. I see. Okay. Understood. Sure. Yeah. Seems like an important application of explainable AI. What techniques would you recommend for this during sure. deep learning model development? Sure. I think today this is very common, right? I think uh, at least with deep learning for simplicity, gradient based methods are the best way to go, right? Uh, using grad cam, integrated gradient, smooth grad, that family of methods is very simple because those gradients are obtained from the neural network. You're not doing, you're not infusing anything external. Those gradients are obtained right from the neural network, right? So, which means that's the truest form of understanding attribution in, in an actionable way. Because if you know that the gradient of the neural network to a certain input or input feature is high, and it should not be the case, you know that some weight has to change, or you probably have to add some regularizer to the training, or you probably have to augment the data in a particular way, probably that particular feature you augment it in different ways and reduce the dependence of the model to that data. You can do all this debugging using gradients, right? So at least with deep learning, I would personally say perhaps gradients are the simplest way to go. I'm talking purely in terms of uh, practicality and not in terms of uh, an ideal uh, answer in this particular case. I think just practicality wise, gradients are perhaps the best way to go. Anshul Bansal asks, what post hoc methods are most suitable for interpreting time series forecasting models sure so uh, i'm going to assume i mean since the focus is deep learning we'll uh, focus on, i think because time series forecasting also has uh, the arima arma those family of methods i'm going to avoid discussions in in that direction but many of these attribution methods that we discussed also hold for recurrent neural networks grus lstms that family of models also so i think all of these uh, because all of them are still trained using backpropagation, right? So wherever there's backpropagation, you can compute the gradient and whatever method we talked about, be it line, which is model agnostic. It doesn't even depend. In fact, for anything that you use for prediction, you can always use line, right? Lime is just one layer sitting on top of any model that you have in practice. So be it, uh, uh, if you're using uh, a, a model like recurrent neural networks or GRUs or LSTMs, any of these methods that we discussed can be used even in, in those kinds of contexts. Right? So, but uh, I'm probably stick to that answer at this point in time. I think uh, if you go to Arma, Arima, I think that's perhaps not within the scope of this discussion. We have been focusing on neural networks here. But I think if you're using a method like Lime, it can sit on top of any other model that you use for time series also. Right? There have been papers that have tried to study attribution for time series methods too. Right? So analysis kinds of papers. And uh, by Rajita Prasad, who asks, in line, the sample complexity of the perturbed samples matter? Uh, that is, the complexity of the perturbed sa uh, samples, do they matter? That's the question. That's a good question. Actually, uh, I haven't seen too much discussion around that topic, so I'm going to assume it's largely empirical. The good news is you only want to train a simple linear regression model. So it, to some extent, depends on the number of features. I think if you're dealing with images, Maybe you need at least 100, 200 perturbations to build a good linear regression model. But if you have a tabular data with just seven or eight features, maybe a lesser number of perturbations should do. So I think it depends on the application. I haven't seen uh, too much discussion around this topic. Uh, so I probably didn't get into this level of detail, but the line paper does look at this method from a mathematical perspective also. In fact, one of the factors that they consider is model complexity, so on and so forth. Uh, which is a little bit more theoretical than in practice. But uh, I think I would assume that uh, maybe a, 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 a order of 100 kinds of exam perturbate, perturbed examples should work for Lime in practice. At least that's what I have seen. I've not seen too much discussion 
around the sample complexity by itself in this in in lime at least just one more uh debai and das as how is shapely computation dif- different from lime uh computation so that's uh they seem to be uh philosophically very similar uh not really in fact right so uh remember the way of computing shape uh, sh- uh, the shapely values is to consider every possible combination of input features and adding the feature under consideration to that set right s here is all possible subsets of features i is the feature under question you are trying to see what is the value of the subset without this feature and what is the value when you add this feature to that subset and you have to do it for all possible subsets in your power set this is huge right so whereas lime is not like that lime you just take some random perturbations you're not considering all possible perturbations or anything like that right it's actually very different in construct itself and as i mentioned shapley values come from a very game theoretic context it's this is more an adaptation of shapley values to explainability but they are actually even fundamentally different in terms of uh, how they are uh, approached let's just do the remaining questions once you finish the talk thanks sure sure yes i know uh, we probably already 5 minutes over is it okay to take 5 more minutes to quickly wrap up is that fine okay maybe i'll very quickly breeze through the remaining slides i'll stop in 5 minutes from uh, now so we have been looking at multiple directions of explainability in our own group here at uh, iit hyderabad uh, so one of the directions i could not visit over uh, over this talk is there ha- there are a lot of efforts these days on trying to bring causal perspectives in explanations it's not just important to explain right so saying that a high blood pressure was the attri- was highly attributed towards the risk of a heart attack is redundant right yes always when probably person presents themselves with a heart attack blood pressure may be elevated what may be more important is what is the causal attribution which feature was causally related to the outcome that's perhaps more important right so causal perspectives and explanations is very important that's something that we have been doing in our group so as uh, ram also mentioned so we had our work called gradcam plus plus which is extensively used uh, in several domains over the last few years we have also been looking at how do you generate human ex- human understandable rationales for predictions right so maybe i'll show you some of these examples as we go so the gradcam plus plus work that we have is something that's been used in several different domains to explain decisions especially on images so here is an example of the rationale that i was talking about this is on a task of visual question answering so you can see here that this is a visual scene that's presented to a model and the question that's asked to the model is why is person 1 covering his face and what our model does is to generate an answer that says he is trying to avoid getting burnt now it's not done somebody could ask why are you saying so an explanation a rationale and then the model generates a human understandable language rationale which says there's a fire right in front of him okay so how do you do this for different kinds of data sets right if you if i predict an image as belonging to a cat and somebody asks why a model should be able to give a perfectly human understandable rationale to say i am calling this a cat because it has a furry coat because it has whiskers four legs and a tail things of those kinds right how do you generate explanations from a human understandable perspective is something that we've been looking at and going back to the question that was asked we've also been looking at the intersection of adversarial robustness and explainability because they're very complementary as we discussed a bit uh, 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 earlier during the tutorial so uh, we've also been looking at causal attributions in neural networks as i as i mentioned so most of these works are publicly available including the code so if you're interested you can always look them up and i'll be happy to share these slides too if any of you want to follow on these later uh, i'll be happy to discuss offline too so we've also been looking at developing some data sets for explainability and doing some regularization based on explanations so on and so forth okay so maybe just to conclude in a couple of minutes in terms of open problems and challenges i think uh, there have been fundamental questions on whether uh, looking at attributions are really useful as i already mentioned uh, uh, pointing to an earlier paper that paper that said that explanations by examples are perhaps better than explanations by attribution so when do you use examples when do you use explanations becomes an open problem at this point in time that perhaps brings me to this next point here uh, 
there was an interesting paper that was published in ACL of 2020, which said that human preferences on explanations depend on the kind of data. So if you give me an image, the kind of explanation I may ask for may differ from if you give me an explanation for a tabular data. So how do you explain inherently and adapt explanations to different kinds of data still remains an open problem. So the role of context in explanations cannot be understated, right? So here is an interesting example of explanations for an object detection task using a state of the art explainability method, which looked at this particular scene and concluded that the obstacle in this in this particular image is the railway track right while the elephant in the room is actually this large rock here right the context really matters in explanation and how do you uh, bring context into explanations is still an open problem at this point in time okay just to conclude with some high level details i think there are multiple other fundamental problems to solve with explainable ai which is is there a universal formalization for explainable machine learning i uh, if you recall I started the tutorial by saying that the entire formalizations of machine learning, supervised learning, talk about X, Y tuples, right? So, but then X and Y are only data and labels, but then we are now asking models to give X, Y, and then Y hat, which is the explanation. We are asking models to give given an X data. We are asking to make a prediction. We are also asking it to make an explanation Y hat, but then all the formalizations were actually built on just X, Y tuples. So how do you change formalizations in machine learning to accommodate explainability is a very fundamental question to ask. How do you balance the trade-off between accuracy and interpretability? Is interpretability always required? How do you evaluate explainable systems? And going back to the question that was asked, who owns the explanation? Especially in a post hoc method, is it the model that went wrong? Or is it the explainability method that went wrong? Who owns the explanation? Uh, becomes a very, very important question to answer, especially in uh, legal kind of scenarios. And I think more fundamentally speaking, from a technical researcher's perspective, I think this is an interesting time for us to look at uh, combining connectionist and symbolic approaches for uh, bringing together logical explanations. Right? Historically, AI has always been at loggerheads between connectionist approaches and symbolic approaches, logic kind of approaches. I think we probably have reached that point where reasoning is something that comes from logic, while perception is something that comes from connectionist approaches like neural networks. Right? So probably it's an interesting time to bring together these approaches to be able to explain uh, predictions of machine learning methods using logic and reasoning. Okay, with that, I'll uh, conclude uh, the talk here. There are some nice resources. I'll leave these slides so you can probably look at them later. There's a very nice series of tutorials called XAI tutorial where the authors have been uh, changing the slides on a year by year basis. And you can look at this to get a better sense of more methods in the space. There's also a very nice book publicly available by Christopher Molnar called uh, interpretable ML book on this particular link, which could also be of further uh, use if you are interested in this space. With that, uh, I'll stop. Uh, thank you again for uh, the invitation. And hopefully this was of uh, some use to whoever joined today. I'll probably stop here and I'll be happy to stay behind for a few more questions if it is useful. That was a wonderful talk, Vinit. Th thank you so much. I think everybody enjoyed just like I did. So uh, thanks again for the talk. Uh, let me just finish up with uh, three more questions because uh, I don't think we have much time. So. Uh, Radhita asks, in your experience, what is the best metric to be used in post hoc explain explainability? And is there any example where ground truth is available? Uh, there are. I mean, there are. So these days, people are creating data sets. You can look up a data set called Google BAM. Uh, I think it's a brain mapping data set or something like that. There are data sets that are being created with explanation these days. Uh, if you see a few recent papers, you may uh, see or I mean, if you're interested, I'll be happy to share those over email. One example is a data set called Google BAM. There are data sets like that. But in terms of metrics for post hoc methods, I think it, it's useful to have a combination of qualitative metrics and quantitative metrics, right? Qualitative is eyeballing. It's sometimes having, because the reason why I'm saying qualitative is explanations inherently are depend on who is the user on the other end. So whoever you're targeting a particular application for, it's important to have people of those kind sit at the other end, have 10 of, 10 of them, 20 of them, 30 of them, depending on the user sample that you may have access to, and provide them the explanation and ask them a bunch of 
questions that you carefully design to check whether the explanations were useful or not. And then these are sometimes called human Turing tests, right? You check whether the explanation was useful or not. What if you presented a random explanation? Was it, was it useful or the explanation given by the model was useful, right? You can use these kinds of questionnaires and studies to, uh, these also give you quantitative metrics. If you have a question and rate the satisfaction of the user on a scale of one to five, you'll actually end up getting some average scores, right? You can use them to check the goodness of your explanation. So these are qualitative, but you can get some metrics through this too. And on the other hand, you have metrics such as the average, uh, the area under the perturbation curve, which give you some objective metrics to measure the performance of, uh, of, 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 of a given uh, postdoc method. So I would recommend a combination of both of these. I think they're important, especially if you want a thorough uh, validation of a method in a given problem. Great. Uh, so uh, Shrika Roy asks, if the label data is having a skewed distribution, will the explainability also be skewed towards the class, which is more frequent in the data? Okay. So this is an interesting uh, question it's actually the the question actually has several layers if you think deeply right so for a large part uh, in fact i probably this word was there in the slides i don't think i spent enough time on it one of the metrics to measure goodness of explanations is faithfulness right so it was there on one of the slides i'm not sure if you caught it right remember the role of explanations is about how faithful the explanation is to the model under question so we are not really trying to understand uh, what is correct. Right? Ex the role of explanations is to clearly present to the user what the model thinks is the reason for the decision. We are not trying to see what is correct. right? So that's the validation part of the explanation. But the role of the explainability methods are simply to represent, to clearly present to the user why a model made a particular decision. Because then the user can use their intelligence to make up whether it uh, to make a decision, right? But the faithfulness part of it is what is uh, really useful here. We are not really worried about uh, how correct the explanation was in the broader sense. Okay, hope I answered that question. Right? So it's more about you're interested in how faithful the explanation is to the model. That's what you're looking at here. Okay, hope I answered that question. Let's just take one more question in the interest of time. So the question is uh, from Mandar Kulkarni, who's asking, does model explainability have a connection with model uncertainty? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, I have not come across too much work in that space. Obviously, yes, I think yes. Um, Maybe yes, I'm not sure uh, because uncertainty is something that you typically look at the output for it, whereas explanation is the relationship between input and output. Uh, so it depends upon how you want to use uncertainty, I think. I mean, to some extent, uncertainty can tell you how consistent explanations are, right? So that in that sense, perhaps there's a connection between uncertainty and explanations, but I'm not sure if there is a more certain, a, a more direct connection between the two, because uh, at least in generally by uncertainty, what we mean is a confidence interval on the output or uh, uh, how much the output varies, right? So that's what we are looking at. Whereas explainability is often about the connection between a certain variable and an output. So they're not directly the same, but one, I can imagine that there could be connections that you could draw where you could say that, uh, in fact, maybe one thing that we did not talk about these days is there are, there, are, there are also attacks on explanations, right? So to some extent, uh, your question could relate on that, relate to that is if you change the input by a small amount, the, the, does the explanation change vastly, right? Remember, in some sense, modern and model uncertainty is about the, uh, a, a small change in the input could lead to a large change in the output, right? To some, to some extent, it tries to capture that using say, uh, things like confidence intervals or uh, any other kind of uncertainty uh, uh, representations that you come up with. Right? So in that sense, they, you can probably connect them, but there is a difference too, right? because explanations is more about relationship between input and output. Okay, hope I answered that question. Maybe if you had a, a deeper thought to it, I'll be happy to discuss further offline. But there's only as much questions we can take in the time available. So sure. thanks again. So the others probably can reach out to Vineet for uh, any other questions.
thanks again for the wonderful talk with me it was a pleasure having you here thank you ram thank you again for the invite and coordinating the session thank you it made it uh, uh, far easier for me to uh, interact and answer the questions thank you so much let's just have a uh, so that ends the session